Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward, and this is Face to Face. Our guest this week is Stephen Buffalo. Buffalo is a member of Samson Cree Nation south of Edmonton, Alberta. He is the president and CEO of the Indian Resource Council, a group advocating for responsible First Nations energy development since 1987. Stephen, thanks so much for taking some time to join us here. For those unfamiliar with the Indian Resource Council, can you tell us a bit about it? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, the Indian Resource Council of Canada was established back in 1983 in and about there and really it was about First Nations that had oil and gas potential and had oil and gas reserves on their lands and you know they needed an organization to really advocate for them with not only industry but with government mm -hmm. and uh, it was all learning from there which you know led to the creation of uh, Indian Oil and Gas Canada and uh, you know, we're, we're currently now modernizing some of those regulations from the Indian Oil and Gas Act, which is uh, very positive. How many uh, communities do you represent? In, in about 130 communities, and a lot of them had, like I said, have the potential to produce. They have uh, significant uh, hydrocarbons in the ground that have not yet been extracted, and as well uh, existing First Nations that have been producing over 70 years of oil and gas. And so is this just Alberta or would this be uh, across the... Uh, yeah, this is uh, nationwide across Canada. You know, uh, we, uh, lot, lot, one of our founders was uh, late Ernold Gray from uh, Wham Jamagjang. I, I can't say the Sarnia area. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, he was one of the, the original founders of Indian Resource Council and uh, it, it extends right into the, the East Coast as well. So, you know, we, uh, we do our best to, with, with the capacity we do have to to reach out and, and to uh, try to advocate and, and continue to help build relationship for those communities that want to. So how did you uh, become the president and CEO <laughs> of the Indian Resource Council? Uh, you know, uh, the opportunity was presented by the chairman of the board of the day. Uh, he, I was currently, uh, at the time I was a uh, uh, working for a small little trust company and, and uh, I was very fortunate that he saw something in me that maybe I should apply and uh, we seven years ago I uh, made that ap application to uh, see if I can participate in this this area I thought it was something new something exciting and it, it, it's an area where I figure that you know I don't have to be an elected leader to to start helping our people in, in, in this area how have you seen things shift for First Nations in the oil and gas sector well, you know, when I originally came to Indian Resource Council, I, I recognized the barriers, you know, there were huge barriers, you know, but saying that though, you know, industry did make some attempts to, to, to help our people, you know, I, 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 I like referring to Elson McDougall from, uh, at the time, Western Lakota, he gave six First Nations the opportunity to own 50% uh, of a drilling rig, which in, in, in the, if you understand the, uh, the concept is that you start making money right away as a First Nation. And not only that, they, uh, they've incorporated some sort of training program for the, for the First Nation members to, to get ticketed and to, uh, to, to, to start working in the industry itself. And it is very lucrative, you know, but uh, when, the, when the well was done and the jobs were done in the, on the First Nation and the company moved on, our people didn't quite get that opportunity to follow the work, so to speak. So mm -hmm. those barriers were very high. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of entrepreneurship. You see uh, guys buying vac trucks, water trucks, and, you know, and, and them too. Same thing. The, as long as the work is on your reserve, they couldn't follow the work where and it moved on to a different location. So those barriers were up. And then, uh, obviously, with the fall of the, uh, of the economy, you know, industry realized we're in the same boat. <laughs> and those barriers came down. So, you know, there's a lot of bridge gapping now. You know, I like to always reference my friends, the Canadian Energy Executive Association. They've really done a lot to bridge that gap of First Nations and industry to ensure that we all participate and that we all are able to uh, work together in this industry. What, how much more uh, potential is there out there for participation? Well, you know, it's, it's constantly growing. You know, uh, with, with we need a few things to change. 
you know, I think the, the, the trend is now being forward, going up in, in regards to oil and gas, and the price per barrel might start uh, increasing again. And it really gives our people an opportunity, you know, to start working and providing for their families. And that's one thing this energy sector has employed more First Nations in Canada than any other sector. So it's, uh, I, I think our people need it, and it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's something that's very important because uh, a lot of the communities are invested heavily into this sector. We don't often hear about those that are taking part in the uh, sector. Do you have an idea how many are working in the oil and gas sector? As of two years ago, I, they, they said there's uh, about 12,000 First Nations people employed in the resource sector, you know, in all capacities. And, and again, you know, it's, uh, it's, it says something, you know, that our people are willing to learn and our people are willing to, to, to provide for themselves and their families. And it's, it's, it's it, we, we can't deny we, we need the natural resource sector here in Canada, with Canada being so rich in natural resources. So what is the Indian Resource Council's role in helping people realize that potential? Well, we, 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 we host gatherings, you know, and, and we, we, we definitely try to bring our leaderships up to date, not only changes in policy, changes in government, but the opportunities that may arise. You know, we, we sometimes get the odd phone call of an investment opportunity, uh, and, and as well, what, what we try to do is, is prepare our people for, for what's, what's coming and, and changes in, in certain areas. So we provide some sort of training. We, we provide training like called Pipeline 101 or Oil and Gas 101. And as well for industry, we provide First Nations 101 so they can help kind of understand communities that they may be working with. So it's, it's always about building that capacity and continued dialogue and trading with each other. Well, there's a, a lot going on in the news in terms of uh, Trans Mountain and Coastal Gas Link and Tech Resources Frontier Mine, and we're going to talk about those all. Uh, we just got to step aside for a quick break, and then we'll continue our conversation with Stephen Buffalo, the President and CEO of the Indian Resource Council. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is the President and CEO of the Indian Resource Council, Stephen Buffalo. And Stephen, we hear about the opposition to pipelines and resource development. Do you feel that that opposition is overstated or overrepresented? It, it, it's, it's really difficult, yes. You know, uh, without a doubt, uh, First Nations, oil and gas producing nations are definitely uh, always cognizant of the environment and protecting the environment. And, and what has transpired probably in the last 15 years is the innovation to protect the environment, but yet finding that balance of still continuing to work and making sure that we don't hurt the environment and the water. And, and it's, uh, so when, when you see this activism, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's so much challenging because we don't know who's speaking anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there, there's all these, uh, these, these issues of uh, protecting water, the climate change, and, and we need to understand that. We need to continue to build that capacity to ensure that our, our people understand what they're really getting into. And, and I think, you know, uh, given where we're at today, we, we've come a long way. We definitely have in that, uh, you know, uh, we, we have to continue to strive to find that balance of economic development and, and uh, protecting the environment, because I, I think they can both work. Uh, I'm very confident in that, uh, because you know, the, the, the ripple effects of it not happening are, I think, more catastrophic than they are of their, them happening. You know, I, I have a lot of faith in our youth. I have a lot of faith that they have the, uh, the knowledge, they, they have the intuition and the innovation to, to help continue to work in this sector and, and to protect the environment in, in, in what you're seeing now. So. As we uh, shoot this episode, we see uh, many of those youth and others that are out uh, taking part in demonstrations, uh, blockades, actions uh, in support of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs who are opposed to coastal gas link. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on what you're seeing? Well, I, again, I, I think there's a lot of misrepresentation. Um, of course, we, we want to make sure the environment is paramount. But in the same sense, though, you know, who's really saying this message? And, and when you see 20 elected chiefs give the authorization and that they want to work, they, they want to provide that economic opportunity for, for their, not only their people in the future, 
of their people. Um, I, I think that needs to be warranted, you know, and I think we have to investigate that thoroughly. Uh, but the hard part, again, is, is, is who's really pulling the string here. Uh, in, 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 in my view, based on some of the research that I've seen, you know, there, there is a will that there's uh, to, to landlock Canada's resources, you know, and, uh, and, and some of our people have been kind of more or less uh, taken involved in that. But spinning it to a for, to a form of you know I want to protect Mother Earth, which which is fine. But I, I think they need to really understand that the, the issues that are truly behind the whole the whole fact of the matter that uh, there is a pipeline. The pipeline, in my view, is safe. Um, when when First Nations own it, then they can protect it a lot better. And then there's there, there's uh, opportunity for the communities to get the resources to continue to protect the pipeline because it is definitely something not only providing cleaner energy to the rest of the world, but it's also giving an opportunity for First Nations to benefit that's happening in their backyard. When I spoke with uh, someone from the National Coalition of Chiefs last week, uh, this is a group of First Nation and Métis leaders who are in support of resource development. The, he alleged that people come on reserve and, and offer hundreds of dollars to people to come out to these uh, protests is that uh, something that you've ever heard of yes actually I have you know a friend of mine uh, that used to run the treaty 7 management corporation uh, when when uh, Northern Gateway was approved this environmental group came to his office and offered three hundred dollars per head of First Nation and five hundred dollars if they're wearing feathers so uh, back then he, he didn't really take too much in the consideration the fact that it the impact it's going to have, mm -hmm. but now it has a drastic impact, as you can see now. You know, uh, just a little story, Dennis. I, I uh, went out to the uh, Queen's University uh, oil and gas speaker series. I flew into Toronto. I took the train from Union Station towards Kingston, and I got as far as Belleville because there was a protest mm -hmm. <laughs> that was happening. And, and uh, you know. The hard part was that, hey, this is really affecting me now. Because what ended up happening is I had to spend another $140 to get from Belleville to Kingston. And then from Kingston back to Lester B. Pearson Airport was a $400 Uber ride, you know, because of that disrupt disruption. And now you're even seeing now that, you know, we, the railway can't move the, the propane. It can't move uh, some of the, uh, the wheat and barley to the ports. So it's having uh, an impact, you know. So... This, this ripple effect, I, I think we have to really put our finger on it and make sure that we're, uh, we uh, have proper representation. Because when we do want to fight for our rights, you know, our, our, our character is not jeopardized. Be because someone who is not, for example, from Wet'suwet'en, up there fighting, is, uh, it's not representing us properly. The uh, premier of your province, Alberta, he likes to uh, talk and chalk up a lot of this opposition, same as uh, the conservative leader that was today, uh, Andrew Scheer, saying that this is uh, not always First Nations people or those most impacted. They chalk it up to these radical uh, foreign-funded uh, agents. Uh, are you seeing that? Is that something that uh, you think is happening? Well, you know, based on what I was told, th th that type of activity is happening. And, and a good friend of mine, uh, she came and spoke at our conference, Dr. Vivian Kraus. She did some investigating and found out, you know, through farm salmon versus wild salmon, she found uh, this, this campaign called the, the Tar Sand Campaign. And really it was an initiative from the Tides Foundation and the Rockefeller Brothers to, to landlock Canada's resources. You know, so... Right now, we're, we're selling our oil to, to the United States at a very large discount. And, and uh, I don't think we can continue to do that. So that influence, I, I, I'm quite certain it's there. And I'm quite certain some of our people are wrapped up in it. You know, it's, it's uh, unfortunate. But, uh, you know, the only way you can uh, address that is, is continued dialogue. You know, like what we're hearing now is uh, we, 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 we have to have that discussion. We have to have that hard talk about what's important for our country, what's important for our people, and, and, and this is part of it. Do you think it goes the other way, though, too, with uh, foreign entities, companies, corporations, uh, funding the, the pro-resource development side as well, though? 
Somewhat, somewhat. Again, you know, uh, like for Western Canada, you, you can't help the fact that you know the oil and gas is around us. You know, and, it, and it's it, given our circumstance. I, I think it's warranted that we participate. You know, uh, as as we continue forward, 643 First Nations will not see very much increase in the federal funding under the Indian Act. So we have to find a different way. And eco the economic development is probably our only way. And, and for some of the communities, it, it's, it's being involved in the sector. And if that means partnering with uh, uh, a US-based company that's operating out of Calgary, that's what it's gonna be. Uh, again, you know, we, we've learned enough now that we can not only get jobs, we can get training, and now we get, we're, we're looked at as a partner in some of this development, which I think is, is very positive because at the end of the day, you know, uh, most of the communities, they're not trying to be oil rich tycoons. They're just trying to attack the issues of poverty, mm. the issues of the opioid crisis, of the murdered missing indigenous women. You know, those are areas that we need federal, we need money to, to address those. And, and the government's not gonna give us the money to do that. So we have to do it ourselves. And this is just one way that we can do it. I gather as uh, somebody speaking uh, in favor of all this for nearly a decade, you must have uh, your own critics out there? Yeah, you know, it's, it's warranted. You know, uh, again, we're, uh, we want to protect the environment and, and we learned the hard way. You know, I'm from the Samson Cree Nation and, and uh, we've seen oil and gas since I was born. You know, the, they're producing oil and gas since 1952 in our area. Mm. And, and uh, we, we see the remnants of it. You know, we see the old pipelines, we see the old uh, stems still sticking out of the ground. And, and uh, that needs to be repatriated and, and do our best to continue to fix that. But, uh, you know, the positive thing is the innovation. You know, the changes in the industry and changes in advancement in technology to clean that up. And it's just a matter of, uh, looking at Mother Earth and, and seeing that how she can continue to provide for us, you know, and that's just one way she's doing it for us. Stephen, uh, much more to discuss here, but we do have to step aside for another break and then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Stephen Buffalo, the President and CEO of the Indian Resource Council. And Stephen, you know, we see a lot of uh, Indigenous communities sign on to uh, some of these projects pointed to as they're uh, supporting it, but we also hear that these impact benefit agreements are often signed under duress or, or you know, that they, there's no other options. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, <coughs> the, the, it comes down to the communication piece. You know, uh, again, the impact benefit agreements, uh, some say that yeah, they're, they're forced to sign because others have signed on and, and uh, really it comes down to their own capacity, you know. And, and uh, I remember talking to a friend of mine when, he, when TMX first came out and he said some of the agreements that the communities got along the corridor were good and some of them were really good. Mm -hmm. So it, and then he looked at the community and saw that, you know, they had the bigger capacity, more resources to, to get that help. And, and you know what, it, it's... Uh, I think that's the opportunity for a First Nations to step forward and, and, and really challenge some of those issues. And, and I think you see that right now with, uh, with the tech mine and Chief Alan Adam. I know he has some issues in regards to the environment and cleanup. And, and I hope those get addressed. And I know the provincial government has informed everyone that they've been uh, continuous dialogue with, with them. So, you know, uh, and that's what it's really going to take to finish it and fix it all is having that open dialogue. You talk about the cleanup, there's a lot to, to clean up out there and, yep. and it's not being, um, you know, how do, how do we change that? Well, we uh, have to work together. Uh, I, I think, again, we have to reach out to, First, uh, to, in, to the government to help First Nations with that. You know, we, we, although we didn't ask to be put on these small little reserves, we have to clean it up. And in some of these uh, instances where companies have come and gone, uh, where they no longer existed, you know, it's really uh, with First Nations and the government to start addressing that, cleaning it up. You know, I know there's programs in Alberta and that the federal government wants to start to uh, address these abandoned orphaned wells, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's important, you know, it's, it's about working together on that part. 
There are efforts to uh, to try and purchase or, or take a stake in Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline expansion, or where are those efforts at? Well, last I heard, you know, there's still three uh, three groups that are bidding to buy, and, and you know what? I, I think the biggest thing is that one, I, the Indian Resource Council has always supported Indigenous ownership. You know, it, it's very important to the communities. It's very important uh, just for the fact that it's an economic development opportunity. But the uh, last I checked, you know, the federal government's still owning and, and that there's going to be different purchases coming down from what I understand. And it's, it's really about the three groups coming together and then trying to unify, I think, would be the best model case for, for everyone involved. You know, there's, there's different components that each of those groups bring. <laughs> and, and it's really working through the differences to, to, to ensure that, you know, our communities all have an opportunity at different levels, you know, to, to be owners. Given the soaring cost of this pipeline, is it still even worth uh, pursuing? I think so. You know, uh, I, uh, to me, I'm not confident that the federal government has really opened and, and showed why that increases. Uh, maybe it's a tactic that they're trying to scare the buyers off because of the high price. But uh, the delays that they were brought forward were because of them, <laughs> the federal government. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, we still have to deal with Bill C-69. We still have to, uh, I, know, I know there's a, <coughs> a willingness to relook at uh, Bill C-48. You know, and those are, first, those are uh, bills that really hamper our economic development as First Nations. When, you, when it comes down to it, but uh, you know, uh, it's very much a very profitable uh, uh, investment. You know, the the shippers are talking about 20-year agreements, which again is a very good start. And then you'll see a 40-year life of this pipe. You know, the integrity and, and the, the steel of it. You know, the uh, the capacity that it has per day. You know, it'll definitely be pumping oil for a long time. No matter who the owner is, do you uh, envision another? Uh, a similar type of uh, actions taking place as construction moves ahead on this? Definitely. You know, I, I know the uh, Slave Tooth and the uh, Musqueam and the Squamish, I, I know they're still uh, adamant about uh, not seeing it through. But uh, again, uh, the dialogue needs to start. You know, it really needs to start about talking about how can we accommodate the issues and the concerns. You know, uh, I, 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 I've seen the press uh, reports and I, I've seen the, uh, the adamant of uh, scientific research in regards to the marine life and the animals and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, those have to be addressed. Uh, but again, it comes down, I think our secret weapon is, is our culture and our, our ceremonies. And I think if we fall back on those, those will address some of those issues that they may have concern that are scientific. Well, Stephen, that is all the time we have, unfortunately, but we do appreciate you uh, joining us here on the show. Uh, we're always looking for new guests, so if you have any suggestions, please email us at news at aptn.ca. This show and past episodes are available as podcasts. You can find those at aptnnews.ca slash face-to-face podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Dennis Ward. We'll see you next week. <laughs>